So, good afternoon if you're in Europe, good morning if you're in America, and if you're in the rest of the world, hello. My name's Dan Brett. I'm a founder and I'm the Chief Product Officer, the CPO of Countercraft. I'm very pleased to be with you here today and with my colleague, Richard Barrell. Rich, hello, introduce Dan. yourself. Hi, I'm Richard Barrell. I'm the Head of Product Management at Countercraft, and I'm here with Dan uh, to show you a little bit more about what we're doing here. Right. So today we've um, put together a little bit of content here for you. We're going to cover off today um, the problems associated with sophisticated detection and response and how we've developed a tool that we think smashes those problems and smashes the barriers associated with them so that your average or well, your great, let's say, cybersecurity team can get involved with sophisticated detection response from the get go. So we're going to start with me giving a bit of an exposition on what we see the problems as and where these barriers traditionally come from. Then I'm going to hand over to Rich, who's going to be talking to you about exactly what we did in our tool about solving those problems and about eliminating those barriers. Then we're going to get back together and wrap it up with a look at what it would mean for you and how you might go about trying to start implementing something like this. Um, and what it might mean in terms of the effort you'd have to put into some kind of system that's similar to this. Okay, right, let's roll. <clears throat> okay, so the first part, the exposition on um, problems associated with sophisticated detection and response. Well, to talk about the problems, let's talk about the outcomes. Why on earth would you want to get into sophisticated detection and response? So I'm gonna go through some of the highlights of things we have down here that make this kind of approach really useful. So the detection of hundreds of red teams. Now for me, red teams are really important. They're a proxy for a whole number of, of problems you might have on your, on your IT security, sorry, in your IT networks, okay? So a red team can represent someone breaking into the system. It can represent an insider. So the fact is we are really good on our side of detecting red teams and the sophisticated detection response program is gonna detect those for you. We detected red teams at NATO level with NATO exercises, tons of them on corporate audits. And that's really heartwarming to have our customers phone up and say, your system got off a message and told us what was happening. We've detected lateral movements. Uh, our systems have been used to detect people homing in and getting close to crown jewel systems. These will be systems that are super important for day-to-day -day production. And our system detects them and allows the teams to respond quickly. Network threats. Okay, so you might have, you might be viewing the world through threats to your, your IT network. So we picked up things like road IT devices that allow people to access the network from strange places in the world. You can pick up people exfiltrating data and strange accesses and the use of credentials onto networks as well. Inside the threats, you know, a continual problem. You might have users who are deliberately trying to do some harm or damage by collecting data, but there's also a ton of users that just through trying to make their job easier might do some stupid things like save some passwords in a particular I don't know, shared folder because it makes life easier, but they create a risk for you. Detection and delay. This is one of the things that I really like. It can take our system roughly maximum about 10 seconds between detecting a really high level threat and informing and alerting the security team. And that's with enrichment taking place and a ton of analysis. And at the same time, because of the way we use our detection and uh, detection sensing environments, we can keep the bad people in that area for up to 48 hours, or maybe more, it depends on the bad people, right? But <laughs> we've gone from keeping them there for minutes, up to hours, up to days, depending on the particular situation. But all of that time, even 30 minutes, is an incredible boon for the people who are defending. And finally, um, adversary generated threat intel. It's kind of a buzzword, Gartner's talking about it now. And this is threat intel that's not just about other people on the internet, it's about you from your attack surface, from your internal networks, mm -hmm. from your use of cloud environments, all of this kind of information is available to you to start using straight away to harden the rest of your systems. And all of this is an outcome of sophisticated detection and response. So that sounds really good. Let's see how this breaks down into use cases. So Gartner's done a lot of work on this over the years, and they came up with this idea of starting with more simple detection and moving into higher sophistication. So we've got basic threat detection, detection and response, the production of local IOCs and machine readable threat intel. I mentioned that on the previous slide. Proactive threat hunting, so getting ideas about what to go and hunt for on the rest of your networks. 
And finally, active attacker engagement. I mentioned delaying or slowing down the enemy so that you can do two things. You can win time for the blue team and you can gather further TTPs and elicit further information from them to thwart their plans. Ghana arranged all of these in a kind of scale of sophistication. There they say on the screen, sophistication of use case. So as you can see, these use cases go up in sophistication and they provide greater and better benefits as you get deeper into them. Now, Countercraft is very, very excited to say that we operate across the entire spectrum of these use cases. That's why we're employed by medium-sized companies, global banking, and even up to um, nation states. Nation states, exactly. So we feel very confident talking about all of these different use cases and how we might be permitted. So we looked at the use cases. What, are, what does it mean about our technology? What are we doing? And how does that compare with other systems you might have heard about? Maybe like XDRs or you know, network intrusion. Right, so imagine this kind of very high level concept. This is your, your internal network. So there are a lot of ideas where people are distributing um, lures across a network. These are the little pieces of information that when they're used, they're gonna tell you, they're gonna give you a tell that someone bad is in your networks. The next step up, which we've seen a number of companies do is to use decoys. These are your old honeypots. They might be emulated. Some of them actually might be real IT, but they tend to be on their own individual not connected together, and they're quite a pain to maintain. Here comes the big reveal. Countercraft works building entire um, detection environments. So collections of computers, they can be as small, as big as you need, and places them around the network, working in conjunction with lures to move people into these environments where we can study them really closely and extract deep info. Now, beyond that, you can see I've gone outside into the darkness. That's because our system doesn't just deploy on internal networks. The main benefit we have is we're completely agnostic. We can deploy in the cloud, on-prem, on pieces of metal. We can do hybrid installations. We can have our back-end infrastructure on the cloud, but operate on internal networks. Our, our flexibility is really important. And so many client networks now are no longer just internal. They're a combo, a hybrid of cloud and internal. So it's really great. We really want to support people and the security across those areas. So that's the tech we're talking about here. You see how it goes on. Let's move forward again and look at this great tech. So sophistication is brilliant. It's got some incredible outcomes. The kind of tech I'm deploying is, 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 is as we described, but what are the problems for a typical you know, IT security team? Here we've got John, Paul, George, and Ringo. We're gonna call them the Fab Four. John's obviously the CISO, Ringo's the operator down there at level one. So um, Rich, we thought we'd sort of discuss yeah, this a sure. bit. What typical problems do we have when someone wants to do something like this? I mean, let me say, first thing is, how do you start? How do you design and think up a system that's going to be able to catch that? What do we need there? Well, that's one of the big issues that many of our customers face is that they're not deception experts and they need as much help as they can in order to get this to, to, to move forward. And there is a process and we provide training and all those things. But it, again, it takes time and it's a level of expertise. Expertise, expertise is a barrier. Expertise is a barrier, yeah. Absolutely. Gotcha. Now, the other things I've got down here as well, how and where you deploy, you've got to have a lot of infrastructure to cover your on-prem and also your cloud, like maybe Amazon, maybe Azure structures, okay? Time to provision infrastructure. I don't know how long it takes you on your networks to get a new server from IT. I've, I've worked with banks where it can take literally up to six months. Yeah. That's getting better, but it's not like Amazon where boom, things are delivered in seconds. So just, just getting the provision of stuff can take time. You've got monitoring. You're trying to, you know, John's trying to work out how much time of my team is this going to do? Who's going to look after it? How can we maintain it? You might be trying to do this with open source software. There is some out there, which is pretty good, but it's a ton of effort to do it. So we basically see two things. Expertise and time are the main um, barriers to entry here. And also the infrastructure is having something that enables you to operate across these areas. But that's a different issue. Time and expertise are the big things. So if we look here, imagine... Our team wanted to deploy a typical installation for us, which is a starting one. Three sort of use cases, maybe some internal lateral movement detection, something around Active Directory, and maybe some internet facing external attack surface to pick up external um, uh, people messing with, with the network and preparing attacks. I reckon it's gonna be a big effort for them. They haven't got the expertise. There's a lot of times this, we're reckoning, we, we're imagining even with some tools, it's gonna to take over a thousand hours across the team to get that done and to get that up and running. And that's not what we're gonna be, that is the barrier we're talking about, okay? This would stop this team even attempting sophisticated detection. 
what we want to get to is a massive reduction in all of these areas, right? We want to bring it from high down to low in expertise, time for designing, deploying, maintenance, monitoring, and then responding to these, bring them as low as we can. And I think um, as we head on now, my system is running. There we are. Now what I'd like to do is say, those are the barriers, we want to smash them. I'm going to hand across to Rich and he's going to talk us through how the different aspects of this, the expertise problem and the time problems mm -hmm. are dealt with by our system. So please give us an extra sort of 10, 15 minutes or so as we run through these, we're going to interact a bit and then I'll get back to you at the end. We'll wrap this up and take questions after everything. Rich, over to you. I'm going to stop cool. sharing and hand it over to you. Okay, right. I'll share my screen. Okay, great. So you should be seeing now. You should be seeing uh, my screen with the access to our platform. It appears that it's not. Let's just try that again. Share button. Yep. There we go. Gotcha. You're up and running, Rich. Right. Let's move this all out of the way. So this is out of the way. OK, so this is basically the front end of our platform. But don't get worried. Let's say you're John, Paul, George, or Ringo, and you want to set up um, a sophisticated detection and response to deployment, you don't really know where to begin. So, you, or your team lacks the expertise that we've been talking about. Right. So we've got you covered. Okay. If you want to set up a new campaign, and campaign is just a new word for us, was just the countercraft word for a sophisticated detection and response deployment, so it's kind it. of a use case, is that right? Kind of a use case. I want to case. fix Absolutely. one of my security problems. Okay. Yeah. So what we have um, within Countercraft is we have a catalog of about 40 different use cases that we've gathered over the years from different deployments, different customer bases, different industry sectors, different technology use cases. And these are available and you can use them within the platform as well. So you've got, so for example, internal lateral movement is something that people are very concerned about. We have a template that covers that. Um, maybe you want to, uh, you're in the finance sector, you want to use something that covers your payments platform, which is a crown jewel, if ever there was one, we have a, we have a, a use case that covers that. Or maybe you're concerned about um, inter, um, remote workers and the vulnerabilities associated with having an open VPN, not necessarily open VPN, uh, could be Checkpoint or Cisco, but uh, an open VPN service that is a point or a vulnerability within your network. So we have a, uh, a campaign that we can use to do that. So these are like best practices bottled up and I just click a button. Absolutely. There you and go. Let, let's, let's, let's like the best TV cooking shows, let's go to one we prepared earlier. Okay. Um, and I've set up, or rather we have, we have set up this campaign, which is based around an open VPN server, which we can see here. And what you're looking at on the screen is a map of the hosts and the service. So it's a graphical representation. Things happen, the bad things happen on the left of your screen. This is the, like the way in. And mm -hmm. then you can see that we've created a path for our attacker to go from some dark web credentials to access our open VPN server. And then from there, access to a desktop, and then there's a portal server in the back. We call it ICS portal server because it could be a portal into, a, into an industrial network. Rich, quick question. Is this my real VPN server? No, not at all. This is this is a real VPN server. This right. is a real VPN server software gotcha. running on a real real device. Okay, but so it, it looks open. real to any threat actor, right? Oh, absolutely, yes. This but is, if it goes VPN. down, is it my production VPN? Not at all. Okay. This has Good absolutely no link direct or any other way with, with the production service. And what we've got here at the moment is a sort of a sketch pad. So let's say you want to customize this template or build out your own custom campaign. Right. We've got you covered. Okay. That takes time, right? Okay. Setting this stuff up. But what we can do is we have this drag and drop interface. Okay. So you can really easily modify your design. You can see I've got this host here. I don't want that. That's, that's cluttering things up. So I'll just get rid of that. Okay. But I maybe I want to bring in a new host a host is like what a computer or what is it like a new service or a new uh, a new deception host it's a computer okay if you like it could be a server it can be a cloud instance in fact let's let's bring in a cloud instance shall we yeah okay let's connect let's do this it. into into we'll bring in a host i'm not going to set it up 100 percent, but i'll just give you an idea um, we can choose from the different sorts of hosts that we have so you can see we can run from virtual environments to um to network devices 
identities, but we're going to concentrate on Amazon because that's the most commonly used, or at least in our experience of um, platform. Um, and we'll give it a name, we'll call it Bob. Okay. Um, um, and basically we are going to set this up. Now I've, what we've done here is we've linked this deception director to my Amazon account. Okay. Right. Now, one of the things, let's imagine John Paul George and Ringo, right? Ringo has been tasked of setting up a whole bunch of cloud. Oof, on that's going to take a long time, isn't it? He's going to have to click it. He's going to have to connect to the deception director. He's going to have to connect to the Amazon web services. He's going to have to go through all sorts of different screens. He's going to have to navigate Amazon. It's a bit of a man. nightmare. But what we've done yeah. is we've brought that all into the, uh, the Countercraft platform. So now using our open API, yeah. um, we can drive the Amazon API. So what you can do is when you connect this, you, you have to connect to our in infrastructure. We choose what sort of uh, operating system. I'm going to have a Linux box. And then we can say, okay, we want to have, um, it's going to be in, in, in Zurich because that's where I'm, I'm set up. We give an instance ID, a username, and then we can start to, we can set that up and we can set up. The so I'm guessing some kind of credentials Allowing that to happen are, are in there. I've in already place. set this up. Yeah, already I, set up. I've, I've set up my secret Great. key and my Amazon yeah, yeah. identity. That's already in the device. And then what we're going so to do. So you've dragged it on, you've done about four or five mouse clicks, and that's going to build me a server on Amazon. What I can do is I can click on this, I can activate it in a little push through, and it'll we are using the Countercraft API to drive the Amazon API. So you can just as long as you're in your, um, you can do it in parallel if you want. You could watch it as it happens on the Amazon, but you don't need to. You don't need to go that extra mile. Right. You can do it all from the in the interface, and that really, in, when we're talking about on-prem environments like these are on-prem devices, we're saving. It's about, so hang on, on the same screen, you've got on-prem devices as a cloud space. device. Yeah, because that's how I want my campaign to look. That's really, I mean, that's like a real hybrid system then, absolutely. right? Absolutely, yeah. I'm just absolutely. saying that so we can... <laughs> what I used to God, it says, I'm Rich's foil today. Okay, this is really but good. But that's, right. that's the thing. The thing is, I mean, we were talking about this earlier, about how when you're doing the on-prem services, the, the, the here we've got, for example, we've got a portal server, uh -huh. okay? This portal server is running a web application. We've had to set up a server, a web server, and we've had to upload the content. Oof. Now that took me approximately two, days? two minutes. Two minutes? Two minutes to do two with minutes. this, because we're doing it all from the same screen. I if you could give me an it. order of magnetude of time saving for the on-prem, what on would that be? It's gotta be 10 times quicker doing 10 it. times quicker. Easily. And what about on Amazon? Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, there we're going into the hundreds, thousands. It's just so, so much. So on-prem, you're going to be about 10 times mm. quicker than normal. And if you're running on cloud, where we can just do the whole thing, it could be a factor of 100. Get this done. Two factors. It's not just when we're talking about Amazon. In this case, we've got a hybrid. So we've got on-prem devices and yeah. we've got um, we've got a, a cloud device. So we have to do them device by device. What you can do if you have an entirely cloud-based campaign is you can you can set them all up. You can draw in the bits and bobs you want. You can draw in your services and you can add your machines in a design mode where it's not activated. You click the activation button and then everything is set up all at once, just like the Oscar winning film. Everything, everywhere, everything, everywhere, all, all at, at once. once. In a matter of seconds. Can we put googly just, eyes on them? We can put googly eyes on them. I'll we'll, we'll put that onto the, okay. put that Look, into the I'm, room. I'm taking you off so, topic now, but let me just see. We've looked, this is a design screen. I've seen how that's good. We've how we cut down the expertise mm -hmm. using the catalog, right? And deploy. now you're talking about deploy as well. So is that I'm taking the deployment time is just massively right. reduced. And so design and deployment on the same screen. On the same screen. Wow. Okay. But it's also so much quicker. Yeah. And that is just is just the is that's the key because you're doing from the same screen, you're managing everything from the same screen. It's a language that people understand in terms of gotcha. drag and drop. So moving on, let's say that you've got your fully customized um deployment uh and you're worried a little bit about it getting stale because one of the problems that we have with with honeypots in general is that you set them up on day one and they're fantastic by day 10. They're looking a bit old. And in right. order to maintain that sort of level of freshness at day one, it takes a lot of impact. And if it's old, the threat actors are not going to yeah, bite. Because they're going to look at it. And they're they're not going to give you fake. TTPs or deploy tools because yeah. they look at it and they go, this is an old stale system. It's fake. It's a honeypot. Yeah. How does Ringo do all that? How does he make a non-production system look like it's lived in? He can't. He has to sit on, on onto it and run he it can't. by hand. So this is where our active behavior tool does it all for him. Active behavior. behavior. What's that? Active behavior. 
it's basically a tool that allows us to simulate user activity. Okay. Okay. So it's like real simulate user activity. Simulate user activity. It's real, uh, like hands-on activity. It's not just running script. Yeah. It's it's using mouse clicks. It's typing commands. It's it's browsing with a with a web browser. Let's have a look. We can set up active behavior. Okay. Right. It's really straightforward. I've got this the service in design here, and I'm going to set up something that we call a persona. Now, a persona, you can see that I've already, I want to use the persona of Ringo. I'll put Ringo in, but we want to This know is someone you made previously. This is someone's made, but I'm going to show you now. Okay, great. Okay, great. so this is, this is Ringo. We want him to be the user, but what I have to do- So is you're adding him like a ghost into this machine I'm to run it. like a ghost into the machine. Okay. So I need to click on the right button um, and then go to my list of personas. And let's have a look at Ringo, right? Okay. He is no longer fictitious. Um, Ringo, he likes to use Linux. Um, he has standard public holidays for the UK. He types really quickly, but he makes approximately a 5% five, 5 error. And that means that if you're monitoring this, you can see that the, the we, correct. We, we've built mistakes into our artificial Ringo. We've built mistakes into our artificial Ringo. Yeah. Okay. He works Monday to Friday normally nine to about 5 30 except on fridays when he sneaks off down to the pub so it's a real complete pattern of life we're building well, okay. well more than that we've given him some commands to run and we've given him some music and we all know that users don't necessarily use their browsers for work purposes so you know ringo's looking at beatles drummer weekly he's looking at pearl drums so he's got right. this if you're look what this is doing is is when we're applying so this to let's a, say i mean i know it's a bit advanced well, let's say i'm a hands-on keyboard attacker i get on this box and i have a look in the history of i don't know what would it be well the thing user okay. access or something and see has anyone used it in the last week am i going to find stuff on yes there? because what this is doing is it's creating user user right. pattern of life you've got history because he's typing commands so these will register in the, in the history right um he will he's browsing right so he's browsing onto different websites. So there'll be um, cookies, maybe there'll be cookies, there'll be browser history, there'll be URLs, there'll be documents that are downloaded. So you're changing okay. the content within the file structure. You're also creating network traffic because there's all of the HTTP requests, all the DNS requests, all of that traffic going on. And then depending on how you set this up, you can have multiple users scattered around your network, wow. all of whom are communicating um, and building up that literally pattern of life, which means that this sort of activity, which would take an operator dedicated to doing this, moving between machines and typing all these commands, yeah, yeah. we're doing it automatically. You gotcha. fire and forget, you set it up, you press the activate button, and, and off it goes. And this isn't going to activate because this is a demo system. So we'll come back. That's why it says, okay, not connected top. It's yeah. a demo system. I've got it. It's, just, it's a demo. But system. this is brilliant because this takes down that whole thing about you can build a campaign once, leave it running over a, a long time, right? Months and months, and never have to go and keep it going. That brings the maintenance operations for the SOC team down a lot, I Absolutely. guess. Brilliant, brilliant. So, so another barrier smashed. <laughs> What's next, Rich? Well, okay, so we've got this fantastic service running. Okay. okay. So let, let's say you have your sophisticated detection and response environment already built. It's up and running. Right. Um, but you're concerned about the overhead of monitoring and analysis. Right, because okay. it's going to be pinging off all the time, and giving me results. What do I do about that? So basically, in terms of monitoring, we've got full interactive host monitoring. So we can click on a host, even at the management level, I can look at the menu, I can see, I can get information about the device, I can see the um, I can see the status of the machine, I can look at the networking status, I can see, you know, I can get basic networking information. Hang on, this is the design screen, isn't it? But you're also using it no, for this monitoring. Is the operation screen. So this is combining operations. both operations and design. Okay. Okay. And then we can we can look at individual services and you can see how the service is running. This is the age, and we can look at the breadcrumbs. We can look at all of the different uh, activity. We can see that this is running um, a different persona. There's 13 we've set up. So there you go. Um, we can look at the, the different processes. Right. Okay. And then we can start to look at how the data that we're capturing is coming in. So we can look at this environment and this environment is a demo environment. So I'll just quickly shift over to a live environment. Okay, and you can see in a similar analysis window, you can see how we're suddenly starting to see activity being reported on those devices. So this blue line on the top, this spark line, mm -hmm. is a re visual representation of the activity. Does it where the heartbeats of the data heartbeats coming out of these different things? These are, right? Yeah, these are the events that are being generated. Okay. And in this analysis mode, we can click onto a device 
and I'll go back to my original in analysis mode and we can click onto a device and we can go to our event view and we can see just how that information is related oh, wow. because we can see just like you can see this blue lozenge that's I'm filtering for just the events that are related to this machine. Right. So now we're seeing the critical security events associated with this stuff that the bad people are touching. Absolutely. Is that right? Okay. Um, but one of the things, again, in terms of analysis, what you're what you're when you're analysis analyzing this data, yeah, what you're trying to do is pull out useful information. Exactly. Stuff like TTPs. Okay, so all of these events are automatically classified against the MITRE attack matrix. Okay? Right. So we can see that on this machine, we're detecting these uh, MITRE, um, these, these TTPs. So I mentioned a red team at the beginning. So if a red team is moving around these boxes, those will start writing up in red on that yeah, attack absolutely. matrix. absolutely. If we go gotcha. to, if we go, that's just related to this machine. If we right. go to the whole environment, and look at the attack matrix. You can see actually the, within the time frame, because we've only been playing on that machine, there's only these TTPs. But what we can also do is we can go to the same view, yeah, and we can identify not only the TTPs, okay, but we can also map that to something like the NIST 800-53 framework, which are security controls. And these are the security controls. These are the the risk. If if the TTPs are the risk that you're observing because of what you're seeing in real time in your environment. Right. The NIST um, matrix is showing you the controls, the security controls that you need to mitigate those risks. So you've got a, you've got, you've gone from just seeing what's happening to seeing what's happening in terms of uh, an, sort of like a, a, a genuine sort of third party industry standard classification of activity. And then you're taking that classification saying, hey, how does that relate to me? How does that relate to my team? So you can give this information to John or to Paul in the SOC team and say, look. Right, because it doesn't matter. It, it's not important that we've got bad people or threat actors in this particular environment because it's set up to catch them. Absolutely. But all of this information, we need to check our other environments, the real yeah, box, right? Brilliant. And they need all of these controls active well, because to, to defend against that very same threat. Yeah, what, what you're seeing nice. is you're seeing that the, with the attack, you're seeing the risk. Yeah. With the NIST, you're seeing, okay, these are the mitigation. The advice, right? The, the advice, if you okay. like. And what this is also allowing you to do is take make a gap analysis because you're saying, okay, of the I'm I'm the SOC manager or I'm the CISO. I said, well, I actually I know that that fifty percent of these controls I already have in place because I have a fairly mature security posture. But I can also identify the ones I don't have in place. Now I can prioritize where I need prioritize to which ones. Get yeah. you. Yeah. So for example, Ringo might bring this up to Paul. A Paul will go right. I see that. Let's go and let's let's go and work. Project uh, yeah. user install software. Like stop people installing software. Gotcha. Okay. okay, so that's that's in terms of how we reduce the time and the expertise needed for analysis. Because the system is automatically generating this information. Yes, gotcha. Okay, and now we want to look at everything is going smoothly. We're collecting wonderful real time, to actionable threat intel. But the team don't have the time to respond to this threat intel because they've got so many other things that they're doing at the same time. They don't have time to, to respond in the same way always to threat actors that are in, interacting with this environment. So I mean, if the threat actors in, in this artificial place, do they have to respond? They don't have to. But what we can do is yeah. we, can, we, can, we can interact with the threat actors. So we can, if you imagine that a threat actor who's working in this environment, what they're doing is they're showing you their cards. Right. right? They're showing you their playbook. They're showing you the tools they use and, and spending use. time as well. Spending time, right? So we might be really interested. We might not be interested in at all what we're doing. It might be a script kitty that doesn't really affect what we're doing. It might be a bot. We're not interested, but it could be someone who's really got a focused attack that's oriented on our tech stack. This is really interesting information. We want to make sure that they stay there for as long as possible, right? So we, we want to sinkhole them in this place absolutely. so they don't move to other bits of the network. Yeah, I get you. So, what so we can that's do, one type of response, right? This okay. is a sort of a response, but it's 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 quite complex to do this sort of sophisticated yeah. response. But what we can do is we've we've developed this technique of using rules, right? So we can set up rules. Now I've got if I actually if I go back to this back to this campaign. And, and we go back into the environment, one of the components is a web server. Yeah. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to, I'm really interested if someone touches this web server, I want to see it. I want to be alerted. Right. right. And there's a couple of things I want to do. The ICS. Background. Okay. So it's some kind of industrial control system. Control system. Portal. Okay. It's, it's posing as a portal into your production environment. But imagine if it was a water, a water company, that could be something that controls 
any iodine kind of in kind the of water any gotcha. kind of critical infrastructure would, yeah would, would, would play so an important piece of kit okay so I've, I've created this rule yeah right and it was really straightforward i i'm i'm not a genius so i Hang don't on, you created like, it from what from one of the events that I've we created, created i'll show you in a second actually. okay that sorry a good point um i'm a bit of a I'm not a genius, so I don't write this query language, but what I can do is I can add or take away fields to this, right? So I'll show you in a second how that works. Okay. But this is just defining the event. It's, you can see it's an HTTP request. It's the first HTTP request is get slash. Okay. So, so if this thing happens, if someone said, you know, if someone sends a request to that, gotcha. server, if they click on the button to load it up, then this request is going to be sent. Someone's using that app. Got it. Then what happens? Then what happens? Okay. And this is where it starts to get fun because this is where we're building automated responses. Right. The first automated response is the simple and most, the simplest and easiest. It's a message to an on-screen pop-up and it's a message to our, our red dot um, notification window. Okay. So we can see here, this is sending an HTTP request. I'm getting a message that tells me what it is and I'm being given an instruction. So imagine that Ringo's seeing this and he doesn't really know what's going on. He doesn't really understand what the deployment's all about, but he can follow instructions. Because we know the context of where the alert comes from, we can send in specific instructions to anyone on the SOC team Absolutely. to do something about it. So imagine this is this is, right. um, this is a ticket in the SOC, open an incident and contact the incident response team. Okay, Understood. And then we have the details of, yeah. of all of the events. Some bad person is on our systems messing with an ICS server. Mm -hmm. Do something about it. Get you. So our team's alerted with that. What else can we do? Then, because um, because we have the ability to manipulate, we can draw information in, but we can also interact with the deception environment. I want to run this script. Okay. This is a script that I've created that sets up an environment that starts a that starts a, a series of processes. I've called it Red Team Blaster Script. I want you to Red run Team, but right, it's going to mess with the mind mess with this, of the threat actor. It's, 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 it actually just says boo, and we can see that in a second. But this is a Red Team Blaster Script that I want to run. This is this could be anything. So you could execute any command, you could run any script, you can initiate any process, you could you can yeah. start to manipulate that attack surface under the nose of the of the of the um, of the adversary. And then finally, what I want to do is I want to send this message to my sim. Now, gotcha. I'm, using, I'm using Splunk in the SOC. Uh -huh. So um, we want to send this directly to the Splunk server, cut out the middleman, because we can it, it may be that the, the SOC team are more used to using um, Splunk or they have a series of playbooks that are already based around Splunk. So it's easy for them to feed that information straight in. And we can do that all just through the, the rules. And the rules are really straightforward to create because all we have to do um, is go to uh, find an event, right? So this would be something I already know is kind of interesting, right? Yeah, because a lot of these things, for example, I don't know if you can see this on screen, if it's if my, you can see my mouse, but for example, we're automatically tagging with with attack. So it's got an attack TTP so, with so it. So yeah. this is creating, um, uh, this, is, oh, this is an MOTD from Ubuntu. We're not going to mess with that. But let's let's say, look, we've got a valid horse. Okay. okay. Someone's logged in. Someone's logged it's in. It's some kind of identity attack on our system using some credentials. What's going on? Right. And I can generate a rule. Okay, right. and I can generate a rule, and you'll see that I have I've already got the EQL is predefined, and I've already got this these characters. So, oh, so I don't have to write that complicated not looking sentence. No, no. All right, get and it. And in fact, it. I I don't I'm not interested in cron cron jobs. Even I know what cron is. Okay, kill the cron job. Okay, kill that. so we, we want to take this out of the thing now. Okay, we could edit it, but just by clicking on that, it's it, gone. It automatically updates. So now our trigger event is any valid auth with root. Gotcha. Okay. And then we can go through the process of setting up. Hang on, this looks interesting. Well, what's all that stuff you were showing me? Well, let's say, for example, they log in and we're using this in Amazon, right? We could set up on AWS. We can fire off a whole bunch of actions. Again, because we can drive the API from Amazon, we can we can take snapshots. We can, more importantly, but, start or stop a machine. Okay. But we could also reboot it as well, which is very interesting. But for our viewers out there, because... We're moving on in time. There's a whole load oh, of stuff we yeah. can do, right, Rich? Yeah. yeah. And you said there's Amazon, there's this and that. Okay, I get it. Exactly. There's a whole ton of really deep and rich actions to be taken. But I would pre-bake these in so I can basically stimulate, interact with adversaries when we talk mm -hmm. about that very first use case, okay, mm -hmm. which is being able to, sorry, on the very first, the beginning, there was a high-end use case, which is to interact with adversaries, to elicit further TTPs, maybe to unlock further parts of this um, sophisticated story can all be done with simple
kind of click and point activity. Brilliant. Absolutely. So that's assuming that that's so we've covered the design, we've covered the deployment, we've covered the maintenance, uh, yep. active behavior, keeping things, keeping things live. We've discussed monitoring, we've discussed basic analysis, we've talked about response. So as you can see, when it comes to destroying barriers and sophisticated, sophisticated from response or designing, operating complex environments really easily, either on prem or in the cloud. Yep. We're, we're covered. We've got you covered. It's absolutely all in the machine, all in the machine. I'm back to you, Duncan. Okay. <laughs> so that's how some of these barriers get smashed. Right. Now, back on my side, I need to quickly share the, the end part of this. Okay. And see if I can find my slides. Okay, we've just been hands-on with the platform, okay? Now I'm gonna try and move on quickly so we can get to Q&A here. So this is just a very simple wrap up of what we've just seen. Now, we started looking at some of the problems and the barriers, and we basically decided that it is valuable to be using this kind of sophisticated approach. We had a look at using our tool, how we smash the barriers that are typically associated with it. Mm -hmm. Now let's look about what it means um, for the team we were talking about. What is it like for you when you use this? So I mentioned this use case before, typically our, you know, people who start using our systems will be a fairly small, but you know, advanced mm -hmm. team. You know, I mean, the, the actual team might be bigger. The people involved with these projects is a bit more limited and they will tend to run out three typical use cases. Now, when we've looked at the figures that we've seen over multiple deployments, we're thinking about pulling in by 80% all the time-based costs. And there's certain things like the expertise, which you just can't solve on a time basis. Mm -hmm. There's no percentage, you either can or you can't understand these things, you know? Some people get trained with it, perhaps they've been through a military background. You know, these kind of techniques are shown, but if you haven't got it, well, that's just, we can enable that with our system. So we're looking at a team, instead of spending about a thousand hours over the year, we reckon it's coming down to much more like 200 and might even be less. Mm -hmm. That's a huge um, improvement in terms of the costs for deploying a system, okay? So here there's kind of two main lists, enabling things and saving costs. We reckon our system does both of this. You're getting high fidelity detections about all sorts of stuff. Rich was talking about identity threats, that someone using uh, you know, a credential pair to get into a system and mess with ICS yeah. systems. Reduced red team embarrassment. Now, everyone knows what happens. If the red team gets a win, the blue team looks bad. Yeah. Now, we don't want to buy a tool just to stop being embarrassed by the red team. You buy a tool like this because it means you're effective against any other threat actor that has the red team's capabilities mm -hmm. at any other level. Mm -hmm. And how many times have we heard, thank God your system got on enough alert to us, otherwise we wouldn't have known that an audit was underway and we would have failed not just the audit, we would have exposed a breach in our other systems. And these are people that, that also have you know, the whole gamut, XDRs, we've, network detection, and so forth. We, we've also had clients who said, we got a phone call from the red team asking us to disable the deception environment because it was messing with their with their process. But that's another story. That's another anecdote. <laughs> we, the red team asked for it to be turned off so they can do a successful audit. Interesting one. Okay, and um, we've also shown, I think, that we've covered um, basic use cases up to nation yes. state uh, state level threats, which is very interesting. We have experience working with NATO, with other governments. We can talk to that. Um, you're getting personalized threat intel mm. gathering. What Rich was mentioning about how you can pick up these um, TTP boxes getting colored in on the attack matrix, that information is available in machine readable format within about 30 to mm. seconds to a minute after it happens to be used on all your other systems. Yeah. Um, we're talking about a rapid res response, but imposing a cost on the person that's attacking you. Yes. They can spend time in these environments and at the end of the day, it's gonna be very irritating and frustrating for them to have just spent a long time basically you know, getting nowhere. So that's very good for you. It gives the blue team a huge win. It gives them time to respond. 30 minutes ahead of a ransomware attack, knowing what it looks like, knowing the folders they've deployed is amazing. Uh, our system is configurable. You saw all the different use yeah. cases. We've got ransomware, we've got securing Active Directory, remote worker we looked at, ICS risks. Basically, if you take somewhere where you have a gap, it's very quick, easy, and light to deploy this kind of sophisticated solution to get coverage within days or hours rather than months when you're looking at other more infrastructure-based mm -hmm. systems. Um, this is industry trends, okay? Back in 2016, we would call this generally deception. Many companies worked on different areas of these problems. As you've seen by the use cases, we took an approach just to detect, to gather threat intel, and then to work with kind of delaying adversaries. Um, now the industry is taking this further. Gartner is talking about 
identity detection, ITDR, and automated moving target defense, we have a part to play in both of those areas. And DAAF, which we're going to put deception as a feed, maybe a feature, this is how we push vital threat intel through into XDRs. So be up to speed with industry trends. And on the cost saving, less experienced staff needed to design and deploy this, yeah. less time to deploy, less time to monitor, a lower overall total cost of ownership. So there's enablers and there's cost savers, okay? Quick little bit at the end, because we're coming to my end of my 40 plus minutes. So industry recognition, yeah, who is Countercraft? We're widely accepted across the industry. We've been here since 2015, mm -hmm. Gartner Cool Vendor the year before last, finalists at the SC Awards for Deception, one of the only companies to be featured by MITRE in the deception category group. We've worked with um, NATO and NATO level. We've done some amazing work with the US government for protecting systems and government-based missions, yeah. as well as with commercial partners, as well in banking, in retail, in industrial settings, in pharma. And we've also worked with some tech partners too. We have agreements with Microsoft and with AWS. We were actually featured on their defense accelerator um, just last year, which is a worldwide um, first cohort. We were very proud to be there. So finally, how do you start? You've seen the sophistication, you like it. You think, how can I get you know, to deploying this? We've been looking at our first product offering, the platform. This is where you will own and control your own system that can be deployed anywhere, and you will decide what gets done and what happens with the data. The edge is our kind of timeshare option. It's like a, a smaller, way of accessing um, the platform's capabilities, but just for maybe one or ma the maximum two use cases. It's a way of having some of this capability, well, pretty much the whole capability, but on a much smaller scale, it's a great place to start. Um, the edge would obviously be delivered via a cloud instance. So that's an interesting way as well, much less overhead. But if you want to have your on-prem stuff with the whole system hosted on-prem, you'd need to move up to the platform. And finally, the pulse. Up to now, we've concentrated on the platform, the edge, how you would generate your own threat intel from your own attack surface. And the pulse is interesting. We eat our own dog food. We deploy countercraft with very specific, um, what we, we call them campaigns, but specific collection criteria using certain IT and certain CV based things that are happening to gather um, internet, well, information from in internet facing servers about who is attacking using these techniques what happens when they land, and what is the post-breach activity. We package all that up and make it available to you. This is threat intel like about threat intel and post-breach activity, which is pretty interesting, but not on your systems, on other people's systems. When you want to make it personal about you, because one thing is to know that a certain CV is being used in the wild, the other thing is, is someone using it against your servers? Then we have the transition from the pulse as external third-party threat intel across the edge in the platform to bring it back to you. Now, both of this has get up and go service. That means that even though we've talked you through the need for Ringo, um, George, Paul to get their hands into this and to deploy things in that, obviously our get up and go service talks and you walks you all through that with the license purchasing. So quite, quite honestly, the team can just buy into this and our own experts will be guiding for you through every step of the Absolutely. way. And we're there to help you, help you with the monitoring, make sure everything works as easy. This is all included. We're good to go. That's now from the offering. Um, if we move on now, I think we've covered quite a lot here. Yeah. We've had a look at what sophistication, uh, sophisticated threat detection response is for us, why that's been difficult in the past, how we can just smash those barriers to start doing it, what it looks like in reality on our system, the kind of outcomes we're getting from it in terms of real wins. Um, and then finally, how, if you want to take it with us, because, you know, Countercraft does have these products, get in contact. That's our product suite. We'd be so delighted. Now it's Q&A time. We've still got uh, another 13, 14 minutes left of the session. Um, I know I've taken up a lot of your time, but we're going to throw it open. You've got the uh, head of product, the CPO here. We'd be delighted to respond to any questions that pop up. Okay. Well, we do have a question from Jao Arif. I apologize if I'm butchering your name, but... Um... This is the question is, thanks for a cracking session, Dan and Rich. Well, thank you for, for staying through to the end. Can the platform detect bad actors in a live production environment and then lure them out to the twinned non-production deception zone? The answer very easily is yes. Uh, there thanks, are, Joe. Yeah, that is our use case. That's our use case. How cool we people. do it, Yeah, that's a huge long answer. But the basic answer is yes. Principally, we would use breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs being little, like painting a path 
on the floor for the for the uh, the threat actor to follow, giving them a path of least resistance that brings them into the deception environment. We're basically grabbing them by the nose and pulling them into the deception environment where we've got them. Do we sub do we supply tools for deploying those lures? Let's say across five ten thousand desktops. Rich? Yes, we do. Yes, okay. We do. What about if it was two hundred servers? Absolutely no problem. No problem. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, so yeah, it, we have a, our own tooling for that to give you a very wide coverage across production systems. But we feel, and we have done from the get go, that adding extra agents or extra software onto production is a no no. Yeah. So our system uses artifacts and scripts will have to be run, but there's plenty of ways of doing that. But it's not going to impact the performance of your production not systems. Really. No. And, it, and the idea is exactly that we use the intention of the attackers to gain deeper and better network access against them okay mm -hmm. normally people on networks are going to be taking anywhere between about four to five maybe up to six hops so it's like the first thing they're going to do they've got time constraints as well they're going to follow these leads through and it's going to take them into one of our deeper prepared environments to harvest the intel about who they are what they're doing and how they're doing yeah. it and it depends on the production environment as well i mean a production environment can be a post-it note on a notice board in the kitchen or it can be a usb that you've dropped in the parking lot so the ability to drag people in, you're not just looking at sort of digital attacks, you're also looking at social engineering and the whole gamut of vulnerability. So gotcha, we're, we're Rich. Good. So thanks for that, Joe. Um, I don't know if there are any more questions. And if there aren't, I think we'll just say thank you to everybody for staying with us to the end. Okay, do you have to say done? When that I have to across? say done. There we go, done. Ooh. There we go. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, so we'd be delighted to talk to people about this. Please reach out to any of our sales team via our web uh, or directly. You'll see on the next screen, I have our emails here. I said Countercraft is, Thanks. we do business all over the world. We have clients from Australia, across through Southeast Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and the US. Um, we'd be delighted to hear any further questions. Mm -hmm. And exactly, for example, if Joe there obviously has a production live system, he wants to add a certain extra, uh, let's say, layer of protection to it without interfering with the systems operating or functioning, very important in ICS systems, I think would be a great place to look at and to start to extend that. Uh, I'd just, just like to add something in the yeah. chat. If you're look, following the, the, the call and you look in the chat, um, we've added the Twitter address, so we're quite active on Twitter um, and also LinkedIn, we're very active in putting up new important information, not just company related, but also some of the fruits of our research um, and threat intel that we're encountering in the wild we'll, we'll post. So uh, do keep following us um, and we'll be doing more of these, I think. Yeah, I hope so, Rich. Yeah. It was really nice. Thank you for your time. I mean, Cheers, as you can see, we've got the brains here and I'll just be doing the, uh, yeah. the, 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 the facilitation. But one kind of... Final thing to say, today our, um, our CEO, my co-founder, David Barroso, um, had a live session, I believe, out in JISEC uh, in the Middle wow. East. I believe, you know, um, the demo was great that we opened up a computer live and people were, were messing with it during the demo. So they was really showing how our system can handle that kind of exposure and give you um, very, very clear results there. So I'm really looking forward to seeing the outcome on that. Tea. It could well be time for a cup of I tea. I think it's time for a I cup think, of tea. I think, yeah, I'll leave one last chance. And this is any more um, we have questions to coming in. Okay. I think we're going to go and pull this to a close. Okay. Let's give it 30 seconds. And then after 30 seconds, everybody will start to sh shut, shut down the system. Okay.